Um, did you know that uh, the dredging industry is actually an inspiration source for uh, Facebook? Who knows that? Okay, I'll talk about that later, how Mark Zuckerberg uses your sector to push his engineers to the limit. So if you think there's no comparison between dredging and Facebook, you're absolutely wrong because he's using you as a source of inspiration. Can you imagine that? I'll talk about that in a second. This is not a story about dredging. This is a story about uh, how customers are changing, how the world is changing, and how digital is playing a role in that. And the things that keep me awake at night is what will happen with humans once we can do everything in a digital way. You know, and most industries, think about the financial industry, think about the telco, think about energy, most industries you can already do almost everything in a digital way. Do we still need humans or can we just skip the human part in the customer relationship? That's what this story is about. And I would like to start with, with introducing you to this robot. This is the robot of my sister-in-law. and uh, She has a pharmacy in uh, Ghent, which is also in Belgium. And um, this robot is actually pretty cool. It, uh, when all the packaging of the medication arrives in the morning, she gives it to the robot. The robot puts it on the shelves. When she has a customer coming in, she types in what medication she needs in her computer. The robot picks it up through a tube system. The package pops up next to her desk. And, um, the, but the coolest part of the robot is that it has a built-in Swiffer system, which means that it starts to clean the shelves when it has free time. So you can imagine how my sister-in-law loves that feature. <laughs> um, but there's something more important, because if you want to become a pharmacist, you need to go to the university for at least five years. If you enjoy life a little bit, you stay for six years. <laughs> and the truth is that about 30% of your time, you're walking around with boxes, small boxes with medication, from the truck to the shelves, from the shelves to the customer. Now, since she has this robot, she can spend 100% of her time by sharing her expertise towards clients, which is increasing the oxygen in her team, Clients are happier because you have 100% attention of the pharmacist and she's making more money because the robot is cheaper than a human. Let's keep that in mind for a second because that's the essence of my talk. What if we could automate all the operational work and because of that we create oxygen among the teams so that they can do more valuable work. Um, but I want to show you one of my favorite robots. I'm into, one of my hobbies is just looking at what robots do in customer service. This is uh, made for men like me. You know, men don't ask for directions, right? Every self-respecting man doesn't ask for directions. So that's why they have this robot in a do-it-yourself store, which is typically a male place. And if you don't find the screw that you need, you show it to the robot. The robot grabs you by the hand and will take you to the spot where you can find that screw. Uh, this is a robot that is drawing your blood, and it does it better than any nurse you can find. So if any of your children are trying to become a nurse, try to stop that while you can. Um, this is a Chinese restaurant where they replace the waiters by robots. I don't think I would like it, but it does exist. And this is a Japanese top salesman in, uh, in Tokyo. He's selling coffee machines. I don't know if you would like it, but the people in Japan really love this. And it's interesting to see how robots started out in, in the factory and is, are now actually into retail, into healthcare, also maybe in some of your houses. This is actually my vacuum cleaning robot, and he's a good friend of the family. And I'm, I'm just wondering, is there anyone in the room who has children that are younger than eight? Anyone? Okay. To all of you, I would recommend you to buy this robot. Do it now. <laughs> Do it now. Just don't, don't waste any more time. Because it, it's, it saves time, of course, but the most important thing is it helps you to raise your children. It does. Um, I always use it to force my children to clean up their toys. The only thing you need to do is you push the clean button. They hear, doo -doo. my two sons are three and five. Then they look at me and they say, hey, you didn't release the robot, did you? I say, yeah, I did. But our Legos are still out here. I said, I know. You have 30 seconds left. <laughs> and it always works. You just do it. <laughs> always. Every time. And in the beginning, it's really cool. But after a while, it's kind of uh, frustrating because you suddenly realize that that robot has more authority over your children than you do as a parent. <laughs> and that's pretty tough. So we had a brainstorm about that, my wife and me, to ask ourselves, how will, are we going to deal with this? And we decided to mentally get over it and to raise the children with the three of us. So that's, that's a business decision we made in the household. And um, we're actually very happy now. Uh, there's, there's one disadvantage. Uh, in the morning, our children always eat bread with Nutella chocolate. You have to do that by law if you live in Belgium. And uh, our children now have the bad habit of feeding the robot with their bread. <laughs> so I'm still working on that. Uh, that. That's a difficult one. And one last piece of advice. Be very careful because the robot does eat your hair when you're laying on the ground. <laughs> and you get that it's around. So be always be very, very careful. But let's get back to this one. You know, these are the times. It's like in my household. My wife and me, we said, okay, the, it, man and machine are more powerful than man alone. You guys know that. That's what you do in your business. You've been doing it for 
more than 100 years. Man and machine is more powerful than man alone. For us, non-engineers, <coughs> non-dredging people, that's kind of tough to, to admit that. But in my household, in my sister-in-law's place, that's what actually happens. And this is what I think will be the customer relationship, successful customer relationship of the future, where you don't kill the people, but where you let the computers and technology take care of all the operational work. We people, we're not good at it anyway. We make mistakes. And by doing so, you create more time for people to do what we can, and computers are not good at yet, which is the emotional part of business, right? And this whole theory is based upon a simple economic law. I work a lot together with Luke. You can grab this as a dynamic duo. And um, he learned me that there's this old economic law. And it's an economic law of scarcity, which says if something becomes scarce, it increases in value. Very old, but very true. The one thing that is incre decreasing in frequency in most industries is the human-to-human -human customer contact between you guys and your customers. It's decreasing in frequency. Some companies think, ah, it's decreasing in fre frequency, so it's less important. I don't agree. Because it's decreasing in frequency, it's actually more important. That one time that you see a banker in real life, you bet they better make sure that it's a good moment, right? Or you're going to be completely pissed off. So a lot of companies today focus on one aspect of the transformation, which is the digital one, and which is crucial to survive. But the same companies often forget that you have something that is a consequence of that. And that's what I call the human transformation. I think most companies are facing a double transformation right now. I don't know your industry good enough to, to say something relevant about that. But that's a challenge I'm going to park with you guys. But most companies that I work with, they're in the middle of this digital transformation. You have to automate as much as possible. And most of the traditional companies, you know, they became big because they're good in the human part of business. Look at retailers, look at banks, look at any industry, the market leader. Most of the time, they were good in the human part of business. Most of them didn't have a unique product. A unique product is overrated. Most of the companies have commodities, you know. I don't see the difference between energy companies. I don't see the difference between banks anymore. I don't see the difference between telcos. I just go to the company that is best in the human part of business. Now, what would be really stupid is to say the strength that we have today as a traditional company, we're going to replace it with something that we're not good at, digital. I think what we need to do is be good, become good at digital and reinvent the human part of business and be good in both. Reach that point where digital becomes human. That's what I would like to talk with you about in this presentation. And this whole story is based upon the five key technological trends that you see right now in society. And I'm talking about mobile, Internet of Things, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, and robots. You know, those five have the individual power to change almost every industry. But the fact that they're happening at the same time is pretty unique. We, we've never had that before. We always had one big thing. We had electricity. We had steam, electricity, Internet, now these five. Because of that, we, we're living in this world right now. Everyone at home, they live in this world. A paradise from a technological point of view that we call home. Some of you leave that technological paradise where you have perfectly working Wi-Fi. If you want to install something on your computer or iPad, you just do it. You know, and it works. And it's cheap and it's easy. Most, some of you leave that perfect technological paradise in the morning and walk to a place that we call work. <laughs> Where it's no technological paradise. If you want to install something, you need three IT people to check out the form if, if you can install it. And uh, sometimes you even have to work with Microsoft Office 2011 if you're in bad shape, you know? So it's not the same technological paradise. The problem is the market looks like this, the world looks like this, companies look like that. And because we're living in this context, we make decisions for this world, whereas we should make decisions for this world. Uh, a banker once told me, he said, there, our people are completely like this, completely like this. And when they walk through the turning door early in the morning at 9 o'clock, they change in a different person, a person that lives in an era from the previous century. That's what we do with our employees. Um, and it's funny how, if you look at our lives, your lives, how technology is actually becoming our sixth sense and that we spend more time watching a screen so that we miss the beautiful things in the world. And we're about to adapt to it, you know, and there's still some <laughs> difficulties to that. Um, this is Washington, D.C., so we are adapting society to it. So you have, you have two tracks, oops, you have two tracks, right? The people that are just walking, the people that are playing with their phone. You have new forms of danger, like tweeting and walking is a new form of danger. <laughs> but it's funny to see how mankind evolved over time. We, we didn't live at that time, but we all know the story, how we evolved from monkeys to what we are today. And then suddenly we have this. 2007, this came to market, and the biggest impact of this device is that we started to take down selfies, right? And we do like this the entire time. That's what we do. And um, because of that, there are some theories that are saying that 
we will adapt ourselves to this selfie era and that maybe in a few years from now we're going to look like this. Because <laughs> <laughs> our arms are just not long enough to take a perfect selfie. That's, that's a problem today with mankind. So, um, but it won't, it won't come so far. N now you suddenly realize the, the importance of this innovation here, the selfie stick, how important that is. If we wouldn't have invented the selfie stick, we would have arms like a monkey again a few years from now. So thank God for the selfie stick. If you ever laugh at someone with a selfie stick, don't do it. Because they're saving your life. Um, and for the, really big, the people that want to do something really funny, you have now the belfie stick if you want to take a picture of the rear side of your butt. Some people apparently <laughs> like to do that. So we're living on this <laughs> side of the curve. And the reason that we live on that side of the curve is that we never had technology that was cheaper and easier than today. Technology has never been more intuitive and never been cheaper than today. I have a question for you, another personal question. We're getting to know each other during this talk. Uh, who was already alive in 1985? Who was already alive in 1985? Okay, I will rephrase the question. Who was not alive in 1985? Okay, and I see also three people that don't understand English, I think. Uh, <laughs> but I won't, I won't look at them right now. Okay, the young people, the four young people that we have in the room, um, please um, play a little bit with your phone, send some tweets about the presentation or something, keep yourself busy. I need to talk to the old guys for a second. Okay? Uh, to the old people, do you know in um, most countries in 1985 what the best selling technology was back then? I know everything about it. My parents had a store and we sold that, actually. Fax machine. What? Fax machine. No, that was not mainstream. That was for a group of Walkman. entrepreneurs. Walkman. Uh, Walkman was for the innovators, not VHS. Yeah, Washington. video recorders in, in general. <laughs> video recorders, VCRs. If you didn't have a VCR at the end of 1985, you were officially a loser. Really. <laughs> a loser in society. No one took you serious anymore. Uh, do you guys remember the average price? I only know it in Europe. But the average price in Europe of a VCR back in 1985, do you remember? What? 100 euros? You couldn't buy anything for 100 euros. No, no, it was 800 euros, my friends. 800 euros for a cheap one. You had euro, yeah, 1,600 guldens. And um, we sold VCRs that were 2,500 euros. 100,000 Belgian francs. But anyway, so you could take two shows on that machine. That was really advanced technology. And my father was never at home in the evenings because there was no one, and I mean no one, that could install a video recorder. You had, to, you had the guy from the store that needed to do that. And there was in your household, I'm pretty sure, there was only, only one person who could program the VCR. That person was not at home, bad luck, no video. And if you wanted to watch a show that someone taped for you, the guy who programmed it always did like this. I hope it's going to be on there, huh? <laughs> or, or we forgot to rewind the tape. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But hey, we paid uh, 2,500 euros for that. That was okay. And today we think that an iPhone of 600 euros is extremely expensive, or how our mindset of technology has changed over 30 years. If you still don't believe me, look at this. The first time that the world talked about drones was December 1st, 2013. It was when Jeff Bezos from Amazon said, we're going to start delivering packages with drones. Everyone thought he's nuts. It's a fool. Too much cocaine. <laughs> exactly 12 months after that expression, because that's only a year, a year and a half ago. Exactly 12 months after that, I went to a small Christmas market in a small town in France, and it shocked me that in that small town in France, they were selling drones on that Christmas market. And you know a Christmas market, right? Little house with candles, little house with glue wine, little house with burgers. Loop that 20 times, and you have a Christmas market. There they also had a little house with drones. And I thought, this is the speed of change right now. A year ago, a year ago, we all thought that Jeff Bezos was an idiot. In those 12 months' time, it became a toy. That's what happened. It became a toy. And uh, I have some more personal advice for you. Maybe some of you will go on a holiday now. I would recommend you to stop taking selfies. I would recommend you to top, stop taking pictures of your legs on a beach, but to do something like this. Yeah. Buy yourself a drone. Practice enough at home. That's important. And then you do this. <laughs> This will be extremely good for your personal brand. Your children will think you're cool again. You will be invited to social events again. And your life will improve if you do this. I can, I can, I'm talking about personal experience. My life before and after my drone, I cannot compare. But it's amazing what happened in 12 months' time. Domino's Pizza started to deliver pizzas with drones. Disney created shows with drones. DHL, and I repeat, this is not Amazon. It's DHL started to deliver packages with drones in Holland. Not Silicon Valley, Holland. You have this one. 
if you like to do extreme sports, like skiing, that's not an extreme sport, but if you like to ski, if you like to windsurf, if you like to ride a mountain bike, you buy a drone lily, you throw it in the air, that's the only thing you need to do, and that thing will follow you for the next 20 minutes and will either make the best or the most embarrassing video of your life. You don't know that up front. And then once you're done with your stunt work, the drone will land on your arm and you have an amazing, impressive video. But the best thing that happened was this. This is a wearable drone. You do it around your arm, then you throw it in the air. It will fly three meters away from you. It will take the perfect selfie from you and then it lands back on your arm like a parrot does. We've been waiting for years to buy this, and it's finally here. So you don't need to worry anymore. You can buy the wearable drum. So if you look to the world, you see this the entire time. It doesn't take, you don't talk about decades anymore. You know, in the past we talked about decades, the decade of computers, the decades of mobile. What's this decade gonna be about? We already had the tablet. I, I read uh, an article today, the driver's car is driving California. Google has them everywhere now. Is it going to be the decade of driverless car? Don't think so, because we have uh, five more years to go. It's going to be old school by 2020. If you look at the world with this, the glasses of this curve, you will be astonished at what's going on today. And does that influence your industry? I think it does. I think it does. I think every industry is being influenced by this. I think we all need to speed up our gear. Uh, I think we all need to be more ambitious. And ambitious doesn't mean making more money. <coughs> changing the way that we work, changing the world. I have the luxury of organizing trips to Silicon Valley very often. And we take entrepreneurs, CEOs, anyone who wants with us to see what's going on and to see that the world is actually being changed at that side of, uh, of the world still, is my experience. During my last trip, I had the luxury of going to this company, which was a unique experience. There are probably a lot of engineers in the room. This is paradise for engineers. This is the Disney world for engineers. This is SpaceX, which is created by Elon Musk. I assume that every engineer has a poster of Elon Musk in their room, even if you're 50 years old, if you're a self-respecting engineer, you have a poster of Elon Musk in your room. If you don't know who Elon Musk is, shame on you and don't say it to the others, okay? <laughs> Keep your reputation alive. We're working on your personal reputation as well. So, you know, Elon Musk has Tesla, but the coolest company that he has is without any doubt SpaceX. They make rockets and they sell them mostly to NASA. So about 70% of the stuff that NASA puts into space is created by SpaceX. They started 10 years ago with 10 billion in turnover, very profitable. Elon Musk calls it his grown-up startup. Interesting. So we had the pleasure of going there. And you can imagine how cool we thought that was, going to a rocket facility. And we saw what we hoped for, movies of rockets going into space. And after a while, the guy that was presenting, he said, well, guys, uh, sorry that I bothered you so much with the boring part of our company. Just launching rockets is boring. Okay, um, tell us more. Yeah, I said, once you launch the, ro launch the rocket, you launch the rocket. You know, well, nothing new about it the second time. Uh, no, no, what we're really doing here is something else. We need the money from NASA to work on our own ambition, which is to save mankind. Uh, I don't know what you, your ambitions are. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. But there is a chance that they're not as ambitious as the ambitions of SpaceX. And then he, he started to explain us. He said, well, Elon Musk believes that we're going to fuck up this planet one day because of bad energy usage. That's why he has Tesla. Tesla is not a car company. Tesla is an energy company. But he's afraid that we won't be fast enough. And that's where we come in. It's our job to save mankind and to prepare an evacuation of Earth. And to do that, the first thing that we need to do is create a backup planet, and that will be Mars. So we're planning a colonization of Mars. And I can guarantee you, if you're in a room with 20 people from Belgium, and there's this guy telling you in one sentence, fucking up the planet, saving mankind, evacuating Earth, and colonizing Mars, you start to laugh. <laughs> you don't think that you're talking with a guy that had too much cocaine. You're, talk you're thinking that behind those doors, there's a cocaine plant. That's what they do. <laughs> <laughs> so that was an embarrassing moment because uh, he became angry and he said, well, I have a presentation here and I want to show you in detail how we will colonize Mars in the next 10 to 15 years. And this is the plan. And then he started to show us. And it was talking about six-month journeys, that it's going to be a one-way ticket, that they're making spacecrafts that can carry 100 people. That the scariest part is that those 100 people will kill each other on that trip, <laughs> so that they have to put them in some sort of a coma for six months. I don't know if you've seen the movie Interstellar, yes. but it's Interstellar in real, real life, what these guys are doing. And then um, 
We had the pleasure of going into that factory. Don't ask me why, but they said, do you want to see the factory? Yeah, of course, we want to see the factory. And they have Star Trek doors. You know the doors from Star Trek that go into each other like this? With the sound effect, it's like, <laughs> really, like that. And some other details I don't have time to tell you, but scary stuff. Then you have to go to another door, and then you have this huge factory there, huge factory. Rockets everywhere. And you have 2,000 people running around there, and they're all wearing the same black T-shirt that says, Occupy Mars. <laughs> We left that company two hours later, and everyone had the same feeling. This is a pretty remarkable moment that we had here, because these guys redefined the word ambition. And then we thought, okay, we started laughing with them, but now we're pretty, you know, we're in doubt. They may actually do it. And then six months later, I read this. A company called Google, that you may know, invests one billion into SpaceX. If you ever have time, read this, because it reads like a science fiction novel from the 80s. They're actually saying things like, Elon needs internet on Mars, and we will build that for him. I think that's the coolest sense. And I was thinking about that. It's actually really smart. Imagine that you land on Mars. What's the first thing you're going to check? Is there, is there Wi-Fi? Is there Wi-Fi? I want to upload some pictures here. So that's the first thing that they're doing, installing the Wi-Fi. This is how, how the world is changing. You don't need a city first. You need Wi-Fi first. And they're going to build this for him. So they're now in, in a partnership. And Google is actually using the technology of Elon Musk to work on another dream project that they have, which is called Google Loon. I think as a self-respecting engineer, this is something that you follow day by day because it's so impressive what they're doing. And with this, they're, they're building an army of balloons that fly around the world and they give us free, perfectly working Wi-Fi all over the world. Um, imagine that you're in the telco industry. This is really relevant. And I presented this to a room like this one from the telco industry. And there were also a bunch of very smart engineers. And they said, oh, yeah, that's nice. It's nice. We know it. Of course, we know it. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Uh, it's good for emailing and stuff like that, but if you want to see a movie with this thing, it does work. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. And the interesting thing is that at a certain day, we got invited at Google X earlier this year, and we took the telco industry to the guy who's working on this. And uh, after 15 minutes, there was a change of atmosphere in the room, because the guys from the telco industry suddenly realized, okay, all the things, all the barriers that we saw, they're, they're gone. They're gone. These guys, this guy, 26 years old, he solved it. And then they realize, okay, the balloons already fly above Brazil and New Zealand, and they work. And it's perfectly working 4G internet. You can stream a movie on that. And then the question comes, guys, is this a charity? You know, balloons above the rainforest in Africa and stuff like that? Uh, no, of course this is not charity. This is the most ambitious project Google ever had. Because if we can do that, if imagine that we can get 3.5 billion people additionally online, and if the ones that are already online, if we can double or triple their internet usage, Guess what that will do with our turnover and our profit? This is not a charity project. This is the most ambitious project that Google ever, and we have a pretty unlimited budget for it. Imagine what that means, Google with an unlimited budget. <laughs> and then the guys from the telco industry <coughs> said, yeah, but why are you doing this to us? We already have internet in Belgium and Holland. We don't, thanks for the balloons, but don't need them, don't need them. And the guy says, well, I'm very sorry, but you guys don't innovate fast enough anymore, and we cannot wait for you. So we're taking control of the worldwide connectedness in the world. We're very sorry, but you guys are just not good enough anymore, and we're going to do it ourselves. And we laughed, and the guys from the telco industry, they were pretty pissed off. They said, did that guy laugh, us, laugh at us in the face? And we said, yeah, that's exactly what they did. That's exactly what they did. How you know, self-confident can you be that your biggest competitors, you show them what you're going to do, and then you tell them, you're too slow. Sorry. To go to another meeting now. See you. It's pretty scary, especially if you know that another company that calls that that is named Facebook is planning the same thing. They built these drones that fly um, for three months on solar energy. They're the size of a Boeing 747, the weight of a car, and everything underneath it perfectly working internet. This is where you guys inspired them. Mark Zuckerberg and his engineers thought that this was impossible, and you know where he took them? He took them to the Panama Canal. He said, 100 years ago, most of the world thought that it was impossible to connect the two oceans until you guys actually did that. He said, if they could do that 100 years ago, we can connect the world. I want you to be as smart as those dredging guys were 100 years ago. And they have it now. So thanks to you, the telco industry will be destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> and then remember this guy, SpaceX, our friend Elon Musk last week, he said, oh, that's a cool idea. I also want to be part of the telco industry. What I'm going to do is I'm going to launch 4,000 satellites to give the entire world internet. 
not one satellite, 4,000, mm. and he has his own rocket fleet to do it. Thank God you're in the dredging business, right? <laughs> Imagine you're in the telco industry. Leave the sinking ship as soon as you can. Are we ambitious enough? No, no, we're not ambitious enough. Uh, we need to speed up our gear. Same thing to customers. Let's look for ways to use this technology to make customers happy, to become more extreme customer-centric. Every company I go tells me, Steve, we are customer-centric. We have a slide that says that we are customer-centric. You want to see the PowerPoint? No, I want to talk to your customers to see if they agree. Because 90% of the companies have the slide, but don't have the customers that confirm it. It's only 10% that has the slide and the customers. Are you going to be the 90% or the 10%? That's the crucial question. Uh, this is my learning from m meeting up with more than 50 leading companies in the world. It's not about digital. It's not about technology. It's about the consequence of technology. And the consequence is that all of us, we expect more. Faster, cheaper, better. Digital first without compromise. Are you investing in lousy customers? Let me show you this. This is uh, a terrible example. This is something that a newspaper has done with Zalando, you know, the big e-commerce store. They ordered clothes, and they basically destroyed it. You probably know that Zalando has a return policy. You can send everything back. You give your money back and so on. So they said, let's try it out. And they destroyed them with scissors, toothpaste, paint to see what would happen. Guess what happened? They got their money back. That's it. No question. No warning. Nothing. Some people say, hey, they're not organized in a good way. I think they are organized in a good way. Uh, I just think that they see that as collateral damage and that they think, you know, hiring 100 people to check all the boxes is more expensive than the 0.1% losers among our clientele. They are willing to invest in lousy customers. That's what I mean. Are you investing in trust or control? Most companies in control, they invest in trust. And uh, Some critical people, um, especially financial people, have a critical question on this slide. Say, yes, Stephen, I have a question. Can you elaborate a little bit on the profitability of Saldo, please? <coughs> and we all know the answer, right? These guys are losing money like crazy. Amazon is even worse, by the way. They make 80 billion in turnover and they still have no profit. How stupid can you be as a management? Losers. So the moment that we were at the headquarters of uh, Amazon in Seattle, we had some Belgian retailers with us. And they told uh, Amazon, they said, guys, you need to change your, your game, right? We have some free consultancy for you. You should increase your prices. You should ask money for shipping. And don't be such a fool by doing these, these kind of things. Here you go. Free consultancy. So you can make a profit like us. And by the way, don't destroy the industry in the meanwhile. <laughs> and the guys from Amazon said, well, thank you for the feedback. Very nice. Uh, but we also have good advice for you. Complaining about our strategy is not a good strategy. <laughs> I love this quote. <laughs> we are not interested in short-term profits. We are interested in world domination. That's something else. And maybe some of you will go out of business because of us. We're very sorry. Complaining about the fact that they don't make a profit doesn't make any sense for your company. That's something for the shareholders to take care of. But as an industry, it's their concern. But the fact that they're changing the mindset, that is our concern. And most of you don't have shareholders that are okay with no profit. So we have the profit game and the extreme customer centricity game. And this is where the good news comes in. I think we have a unique opportunity to create a new form of customer centricity where we combine the strengths of digital and human. It wasn't possible for the, let's say, traditional industry a few years ago. Today we can. But it means that you understand that digital is not about Facebook and Twitter. Digital is actually about the end of the offline world. There is no offline world. We are constantly connected and it will get worse. This is the challenge for companies from a traditional company that want to go to the digital company. They have to make something that is simple and easy to use. And that seems to be the hardest thing in the world. Look, this is a symbolization of that. You want to make something that if the customer pushes a button, that it works. And if the customer moves his arms, that it works. That's what you want to achieve. What you want to avoid is this. <laughs> <laughs> Let's watch this a second time and pay attention to the dad. He represents the customer service department of an average company, you know. He will be completely unfocused on the problem. You will see that in a second. Here you go. And it will be, mm, you yeah, too late. As, as the these are the hyped companies in the world. And you can like these companies or you can hate these companies, but they set the tone. And they have one thing in common. They are fast, they are easy, they are fun. That's what they are. That's what they do. That's your checklist. Doesn't matter which industry you're in, if you make something digital, fast, easy, fun are your keywords. And the easier, the better. Sometimes we have the tendency to make it complete. Don't make it complete. Make it easy. Look at all the new stuff that comes to this world. All the new stuff. It's easier and easier. Most popular app at this moment on the Apple Watch, without any doubt, Uber. 
Why? Because you only need to do this. You tick it, and there's your cap. That's it. That's it. Simple. Simplicity. Think about payments in the future. I'm so much looking forward to the days that the credit card is out of my wallet. I hate a credit card. It's a middle-aged interface for payments. Plastic machine buttons. Foolish. Waste of time. Waste of time of all this. We could do a lot of work at the same time. Now, Facebook is into payments. They started with payments in the U.S. a few weeks ago. And I was at a big bank a few, uh, last week, and I, I was really angry at them. I said, why didn't you come up with this? Because this is the easiest, fastest, and the most fun way of payment I've seen in my entire life. And for Facebook, this is not the core business. It's not. For you guys, the banking industry, this is your core business. Why didn't you do this? And they said, well, Stephen, we also had the idea. But we also had the meetings, we also had the steering committee, and we have six PowerPoint presentations. That's what we have. Took us 60 months to make the perfect PowerPoint presentation. Took them 16 months to make it. The expectation level of speed and service is increasing every single day. Think about this world, the good old days, and today's world. In the good old days, three days as a reply speed was okay. Today, three hours is slow. And if you don't give customers what they want, they will tell them. And they will become very, very creative. In time. Be careful with the ketchup. It's one of the learnings of this. <laughs> but we're almost in this world of zero tolerance for, for digital failure. And I want to share this moment with you guys. It was this year, January 27th, a world disaster happened. It was at 7.45 European time zone, this time zone. Do you guys remember what happened? Yes. What happened? Google. No, close. <coughs> close. There's a hidden sign on this slide that tell you, tells you the secret. Facebook was down. Facebook was down for 27 minutes. And I can tell you, the entire world, and I mean the entire world talked about this. This was breaking news on every radio station, every website, and every TV channel at that moment. I got actually two phone calls from two journalists in five minutes' time. They all asked the same thing. They said, what's going on? I said, well, Facebook is down. They said, we know. And now what? I said, I think it will come back. <laughs> and that was my most visionary moment in my life. <laughs> I was right. 27 minutes later, the prediction was already there. But I was thinking, okay, the fact that a platform like that is out becomes more important than a terrorist attack, than Ebola, than IS, than any political game that was going on right there. No, no, no. We have serious issues right now. Facebook is that. Let's solve that one first. <laughs> now we're going to talk about terrorism again. <laughs> first things first. Good thing we had Twitter that day to complain about the fact that Facebook was down. I don't know what we would have done without Twitter that day, to be honest. But we're at a turning point, right? It's the self-service model that we gave to consumers is now going to a moment of automation where you don't want to do it yourself anymore. You want things to happen. Just imagine what would happen if everything in this room is connected. What if everything in the supermarket is connected? What if everything in your house carries a sensor? Five, ten years from now, it will be like that. We won't buy shirts anymore without a sensor in it. You won't buy a mattress anymore without a sensor in it that will give you your feedback on how you slept in the morning. You don't need an alarm clock anymore. You just need a mattress. I went to a mattress company the other day. They said, we're making a smart mattress, and the mattress will wake you up at the exact right time that you feel fantastic. Making it. Um, it means that the internet is about to disappear. Because the internet now is still something, it's a button that you push, the Explorer or Safari button, then you're online. If everything is connected, internet is as present as the oxygen in this room. And it will change a lot, you know? And it won't just be things. We're always talking about internet of things. I prefer the term internet of everything, because it's also gonna be us. It's gonna be us. We're gonna be connected. We're really, really close to that. This would have been a stupid slide five years ago, right? Can Facebook get, get access to our heartbeat? Yeah, of course it can. Of course. You know, the, the Belgian government is really tough lately. They, they sued Facebook for privacy. I was wondering how Mark Zuckerberg thought about that, or if he knew it, if he was awake about the Belgian government uh, lately. The truth is Facebook is doing nothing bad for privacy. We are. Facebook, there's no rule that you can only use Facebook if you post three pictures of your kids every day. There's no rule like that. I do that. You do that. We stretch the limits of privacy. That's what we do. Privacy is not the issue, by the way. Security is. I, I trust Facebook more than cyber criminality. But this is just the beginning, you know? If you have an Apple Watch and a baby, there are only 10 people in the world who have that combination, but still, those 10 people, <laughs> they don't take a picture of the baby anymore for Facebook. They capture the heartbeat of the baby, post on Facebook. Look how foolish we are if we go to a doctor to, to have a heart checkup. They only listen for 30 seconds. I'd rather send them my entire year of heartbeat so that they can see if this is an exception or if something is fundamentally wrong. It's going to be difficult to live an unhealthy life, which will be good for people like me. 
Imagine that you want a Snickers bar in the morning. You buy one from a machine here in the hallway, and then after, after during the break, you want another one. The machine will recognize you. It will check your phone. It will say, "No, my friend, you've been on a chair for two hours. No more Snickers for you." <laughs> so we'll actually have to pay someone to get another Snickers bar. Right? That's, that's our future. So Snickers will become more expensive real soon. But I'm going to this company pretty soon. It's called VivaLink. They have the ambition of making the first mainstream sensor to put on our arm. It's a little sticker, actually. It's called an e-skin. You put it on your arm, and you will have all your blood values in real time on your phone. So you can gamify a little bit with your blood and stuff like that. So if you look at all these things, it's the end of reactive healthcare. You don't wait until someone becomes sick and then try to heal them. You make sure that they don't become sick anymore. Better for us and better for society. A lot cheaper. You won't be able to afford the traditional healthcare model. But if you translate that to customer service, the same thing will happen. It's the end of reactive customer service. It, it's a world where fast is not fast enough. If you guys make machines or if you do stuff and it has sensors in it, then I expect you to anticipate. If you have data about me, I want you to anticipate. I was talking with a company that's making central heating systems. And they're making a smart central heating system. And it will send me a text message a week before it breaks down. It will sound like this. It will say, hey, Stephen, I'm your central heating system. I hope you are fine. Uh, I'm not, by the way. I probably won't make the end of the week, so I would really like you to push OK right now that they can send someone to fix me. Uh, warm regards, your central heating system. P.S. I checked the weather report. I really recommend you to push OK right now. <laughs> but imagine that my central heating system can do that. What do I expect from my bank? What do I expect from my insurance company, from my car company? What do I expect from your companies? Fast is not fast enough. I don't want you to anticipate. I don't want to complain anymore. They know perfectly well. How many people will be at a certain place at what time? It is an airport. They know it almost by the minute. And still we have to wait in line sometimes. That is bad intentions. They don't want to offer us good service. And then I'm becoming really, really angry with that. <laughs> but people also understand, okay, if everything, if customer service becomes proactive by the use of data, it's the end of humans in customer service. Humans cannot do that. It's the machine that will do that. It's proactive data analysis that will do it. The, the central heating system does it itself, not someone from, not a person. So the question at this point is, do we still need humans, or can we do everything with technology? I'm, I'm pretty sure we can do everything with technology. I think we can. Question is, do you want it? Question is, do consumers want it? And, and the good news is that I think I've found an alternative for the digital power. You will see it on the next slide. One of my favorite t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> even, no, even Google has competitors. That's, that's what we learned from this slide. But um, a lot of things are changing, right? And of course, it means that the role of people will change fundamentally in the next few years. They won't disappear. It will just change fundamentally. I'm convinced that if you want to achieve a customer service level that is bigger than average, you need more than digital. You need the human part of business as well at that moment. And there's one word that we didn't talk about that much yet, and it's the word emotion. I think computers today are not good at emotion yet. I know. There are a lot of smart people that try to program empathy and stuff like that, but we're long ways from the emotional thinking like we do as humans. So I think we need to invest as humans in those things where computers are not good at. And I brought a movie for you to show you. I know you are probably a lot of you are technological people. I'm a, I'm, I love that as well. But I want to show you that there are limits to the power of technology. I think that's important to understand. And that there are things in the human touch that technology can never replace. And I brought a brilliant movie for, for you to prove you that. I hope you will like it.
I really love that movie. Technology will never replace love. Uh, this is the soft side of the presentation, so now we're going to change the atmosphere completely. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we need humans. Uh, and the funny thing is, that what are the possibilities that we leave out if we don't invest in this? Ask yourself the question. Because there's, there's an important part of creating an emotional business relationship, even if you're in a very rational technical business like you guys. Uh, the frontline employees are crucial. You know, they connect with, with clients. They, they know them. And the second line has to support them in that. And I think these are values that we underestimate. These are typically human values, things that we can do that computers cannot do. I'm talking about empathy. I'm talking about passion, creativity. Never met a passionate computer, never met a creative computer until now. Maybe two decades from now it will be different. But, and the funny thing is, the more the world becomes digital, the more value this has because of the scarcity, remember? And uh, ask yourself the question, do we motivate employees to do this or do we hold them back? Just a question. Because the funny thing is that you have people that can do remar remarkable things, uh, very creative, very passionate, and the moment you place them somewhere else, they fail. Very interesting. You know, imagine that Messi would have said up front, I will do this, the most remarkable move of the year. Um, I think everyone would say this is completely impossible to do it, but once you've done it, it's remarkable. It's like the Panama Canal. You know, up front, it's impossible. At the end, it's the most beautiful thing there is in the world. What would happen with Messi if he plays for Mourinho at Chelsea? Would be, he be allowed to do this? I don't think so. Would be on the bench if he does something like that because it wasn't in the rules. <laughs> you know, if you change the context, most people are creative, most people are talented. If you put them in the wrong context, they lose that. Our educational system does whatever they can to beat the creativity out of my children. But every one of us is creative. Are we investing in this or not? My apologies, my apologies. You, you wanted to watch yeah, the entire game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you said, oh, finally, finally, an interesting slide here in the first page. But this is the scary part of the day. I know you guys are, are technological guys and, and very smart people. I, I, I want to check if you guys will be capable in that or if you guys are really lost for the future. So this is a, a point where I'm a bit nervous, I have to admit that. So I would like you to focus completely on this slide. And the funny thing is we all see a lady dancing, but we're not all seeing the same thing. Some of you can only see her dance clockwise, others can only see her dance counterclockwise, and others can see her dance in both directions. She switches sometimes. This is very important. This will determine your future. So I'm a bit nervous. I hope it will go well and that I don't ruin this beautiful evening right now. It's a little bit dangerous. Who can only see her dance clockwise? Okay, okay. It looks good. Looks good. Who can only see her dance counterclockwise? Okay, four. Okay, five. That's limited damage. Limited damage. <laughs> Bad news for these guys, but on average we're okay. Uh, who can see her dance in both directions? Both directions. Yeah, both directions. Left and right. Okay, you guys, congratulations. You guys are the super brains in the room. I hope everyone has seen it. <laughs> Every, are you a super brain that wants to have the cross? No, no, I'm sorry. I have to catch a train. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, thank good you. Good thing that you came to say goodbye to me. Thank you. Um, the super brains are the people that are really good in the emotional and the rational part of the business. So, congrats. Uh, a lot of you. Uh, the first group, congratulations as well. You guys are really good in the emotional part of business. You know, the guys that love theater dance clockwise. The other four. Bad news, bad news, it's the, probably the end of your career in a few years. <laughs> but try to work on these skills, that's what I would uh, ask someone to coach you on it, and you, you, you will make it, you will be okay. This is, my, this is my favorite slide. Computers personalize people, make it personal. It sounds the same, but it's a huge difference. Personalization is programming, data, content, consumers. Making it personal, you need to do that every single day. Computers predict human surprise. Everything is predictable, but we can still surprise people. Computers deliver, we over deliver. Computers do what they are programmed to do. We can do more. Computers confirm and people can smile. I can keep going on like that. And my message is not one is good or one is bad. The message is they're different. They add a different value perspective to the world. But sometimes we forget the power of the human touch. Sometimes we think technology is the solution for everything, and that's not. It's not the case. A lot of people want to have that human part in the business as well. So to round it off, um, if you ask my opinion what the future of customer relationships will be, I'm pretty convinced digital will play a crucial role in that. Technology will play a crucial role. But I'm also convinced that if we don't talk about the changing humans, the, the role of, of the changing role of humans in that, I think we miss out on a big opportunity. Uh, I think companies need to reflect on that. And I think companies need to wonder what are the different moments that we're in touch with customers, where do we go for automation, but also where do we go for the human touch. 
And if you're thinking, yeah, but in our industry we don't do that. If that would be the case, that is fantastic. Because then it's not scarce, it's just non-existing. That would be complete radical innovation. And if no one else does it, the value goes up. So it's an opportunity. Digital and human don't fight with each other, they reinforce each other. They, are, they have different strengths. What if you're good in both? What if you are good in both? What if you're good in digital? You make things fast, easy, fun. What if you're good in the human part? Empty, passion, creativity. Then you reach a unique new form of customer centricity, unique, or you reach that point where digital becomes human. Smart companies understand that. Smart companies see that markets are becoming digital and they move along with it, but they also understand that only investing in digital is not enough, and they look for ways to reach that point where digital becomes human. I wish you a lot of luck with that, and thank you very much for listening.